Welcome to Real Money Talks, how to make money, manage money, and invest money. Your Real Money Talks host, Laurel Langmire, gets straight to the point about what it actually takes to make money and build lasting wealth in today's changing economic climate. If you're ready to get the financial results you've always dreamed of, keep listening. Real Money Talks is the right place for you. And now here's your host, Laurel Langmire. Hi, this is Laurel, and you're at Laurel's Real Money Talks, where we're talking about making money, keeping money, and investing money, and we do it off Wall Street. So what that means is if you invest in a stock, let's just call it Starbucks, Apple, Coke, whatever, IBM, and there is a problem at the Operation 11. You are a stockholder, and you have nothing to do about it besides reduce your stock and lose your money. Off Wall Street gives you control. It's at the street level, which means, I'll just give you an example. We're going to go buy a marina right now. 500 boat slips. We make 3,500 per year per boat slip. Um, We have an expert in boats and construction and docks and rentals and convenience stores. So we bring a team together. Then the team brings in investments, which is your dollars, that can invest differently. Now you own a company that is controlled by real people with real names, real addresses, Not that the Coke executives and the Apple executives don't have them, but you don't know them. I want you to invest off Wall Street. And I have the newest kid on the block today. It's called Cannabis. And it has been around, we are actually seven years into this industry. So we're a little late to the party. But I am in the party. And we have uh, extraordinary opportunities and offerings and just teaching you about how this extraordinary asset class is going to be a multi-billion dollar industry. So just like the gold rush in the 1800s, you could sat on the sideline and stayed in Kansas or you could have went west. So uh, we have with us an extraordinary webinar. It's a collective of five, almost five hours. It'll be broken up to a variety of podcasts. So this will be a series of five podcasts out of each webinar. So get ready, get a pad and paper, And if you want to learn about the greatest new industry, and even if you don't want to learn about the product, I don't do the product. I don't know. I don't even like know hardly anything about the product. I know the industry and being part of a new industry growing in the world is an extraordinary opportunity. So take it, learn about it and enjoy the series. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Ask Laurel webinar with the Cannabis Investing Edition. We're very happy to have you here. My name is Thomas Hall, and I'm part of the Millionaire Maker team here at Live Out Loud, and very excited to be with you on this webinar where we're going to be discussing literally the next gold rush for you wealth builders out there. Cannabis is quite the emerging uh, industry. It's getting a lot of excitement, getting a lot of attention, and it is where you need to be if you're looking at making uh, being, are looking to invest in the next emerging industry, the next gold rush. Uh, as we get ready to go here, uh, we do have Laura Langmeyer on the uh, call today. We also have a special guest <laughs> who is getting settled. Uh, we're going to give a couple more minutes to get everyone on the line. We had over a thousand registrants for the call today, having a lot of interest in this webinar. And very happy to have you here. As there will not be a replay link, um, this is such an important opportunity. We want to make sure that everyone is here, and getting the information, and truly committed to what we have uh, for you all. Uh, So as we get started here, I want to let you know, again, this is an Ask Laurel webinar. During the course of the webinar, you will be able to ask us us questions as we have our conversation. You can do so in the question line. You can do so in the chat line. The staff will be on uh, answering questions, answering questions live, and then feeding the questions to Laurel and the special guest as we get going. So to get started, I'd like to ask everyone where you are from. Go ahead and type that up in the question box or the chat box. We'll respond. And I give another 30 seconds or so before we get started. Make sure we have everyone and ready to go. Laurel, how are we doing today, ma'am, before we get started here? We're awesome. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Very excited to be here. Very excited to be learning about the uh 
the, the cannabis investing today. Obviously, this is quite the uh, opportunity and quite uh, an interesting field to get invested in. Obviously, it's a little bit different than your traditional <laughs> areas that you play in, Laurel. It should, it's, uh, it's not as, I should say, traditional. It's just, it's another off Wall Street asset that's been in, in the background um, and we're bringing it to the forefront. And I'm, as, as people I think, think know, and I'm, you know, more and louder and louder about is I'll be actively involved in it. So, you know, I became a real estate and a gas and oil millionaire way back in the day. I think that this industry will cr produce an extraordinary amount of millionaires. So uh, we're going to be right there helping them and just bringing great experts. So today, Ben Jackson's with me, who's uh, just uh, super, super fun, number one. Uh, met him through Ben Williams and uh, lives in Vegas and will be uh, talking to us today, he uh, is a managing partner of Basin Consulting Group, and we're going to be going through just the cultivation, the details, the financing. Uh, we are we are getting together our, our offering and what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing that and can, uh, the considerations. As far as the locations, I think we're pretty clear where we're going to be purchasing um, at least the initial uh, assets, which will be in Vegas, um, and many of you know Weldon. Weldon just uh, found uh, a northern Nevada uh, land and warehouse to do another cultivation. So it's on the move, and we're going to be not only just educating, but actively uh, investing and managing and leading in it. So we're excited about it. Awesome. Yeah, we got a lot of people who are excited about it today, and we have a fairly wide audience today. I mean, we have people from across the United States, have a couple of people in uh, Canada, a couple of uh, Europeans on the list here as well. So truly get some uh, international flavor to the conversation today. So I know you all want to learn more. We're going to go ahead and get started. Again, I want to thank everyone to coming to the Ask Laurel webinar today. As always, if you have questions, please put them in the question box or the chat box, and we'll be happy to feed those to our special guest as we have uh, the opportunity to do so. Uh, Laurel's kind of teased him a little bit, but uh, Laurel, can you go ahead and introduce Ben to the group at large today? I sure will. So again, I'm gonna have Ben, you uh, come on, welcome to the call, welcome to our Live Out Loud community. And uh, just say a little bit about you know your background. I mean, you haven't always lived in Vegas and haven't always been in this business. So maybe a little background of the uh, M&A, taking companies public. I mean, so not only just uh, expert in cannabis, but really business expert and finance expert. Yeah, my background is really in business development, venture capital. I, I, I've, I've always, I love the venture capital, the corporate finance side of the business world. That's my background. I come from the dot-com world in the, in the 90s and, uh, and, and helped facilitate a, a lot of companies from incubating uh, into developing into uh, you know, full operating successful enterprises uh, from the financing and the marketing and the really the assembling of their, of their whole general strategy. That's really where I specialized and was most successful in. The cannabis space, as I'm sure you're all aware, several years ago became quite the topic all over the country and all the news, the headlines. And I kept getting pitched on cannabis, cannabis, cannabis. And to be honest with you, um, I'm, 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 I was a person who was probably as, as novice and knew as little about cannabis as you could possibly know five years ago. I uh, knew, and, and so out of interest and curiosity, I went out to Colorado to look at some transactions and just became fascinated and absolutely fell in love with the business. And I spent the next year in Colorado from a financing M&A background of looking at transactions looking at companies and and, and 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 what's great about coming in from that position into companies is people open up their businesses to you because we had in we had um capital looking for uh, opportunities in the in the cannabis space and we were looking for the right opportunities and we so we you know i i i I learned, and I, I'm a quick study. I believe I like to think I'm a, I'm a pretty quick study of of these things, and so I I really got to go in and out of the operations of dozens and dozens of businesses in Colorado, in California, and in in, in evaluating where the opportunities were. We um, 
uh, and, and it, you know, that's how I got into the space. We ended up passing on the deals in Colorado. We actually had uh, a, a couple of dispensaries and, a, and three different cultivation facilities under contract and in escrow. Uh, we ended up walking away for that for, for some reasons, which I'll, I'll get into later on uh, in today, and decided to focus on Nevada. Uh, we felt that Nevada and then coming up in California were more interesting opportunities uh, than what was going in Colorado. Even though there was a lot going on out there, um, we we felt that there were there were better opportunities and uh, in, in in other locations and and, and whatnot. There there are tr there are tremendous and and the truth is is that there are tremendous opportunities in every space, in every state that has legalized, in every jurisdiction that has legalized. You just need to find what those right opportunities are. Um, mm -hmm. For us and wh where we were, we, we, we felt like strategically it was best for our personal money to, to do something right here in Las Vegas. And that was part, part to do with kind of where I wanted to start today is, is the number one question that I'm asked by people that aren't in the industry much or aren't too familiar with it are the federal laws. Is it legal? Is it legal for me to own it? You know, what's going to happen? Attorney General Sessions, is he going to come down and arrest everybody? Um, <laughs> that, that I get that I get that statement said to me on a on a on a fairly regular basis. Um, uh, not regular basis, but you know you, you you get that question. And at the end of the day, the federal government put out. There's really two different mammals. Banking is the other big thing. Is well, it's a cash business, and you can't bank it. That's the general perception. That's actually not a true statement. But that is a perception out there, um, and and there's a reason why that's a perception um, that's out there in the in the industry and and at large. So the first thing is a Cole memo. Uh, he was the deputy attorney general for the Department of Justice, and in about 2009, he put out this memo, and this is really what started Colorado. And uh, Colorado is really on the forefront of this, and when and this co memo came out overnight you had 1100 dispensaries open up almost overnight in the state of Colorado based on this co memo and essentially what the co memo says i sent i sent you a link so you guys can all read it for yourselves and interpret it I, i'm by no means am i an attorney and don't want to give any legal interpretation of it but the way i read that memo is it effectively says that the department of justice has always taken the position that what they view as small time drug dealing marijuana in this case marijuana business up to the local jurisdictions that the federal government is still going to be concerned with major international drug rings but when it comes to state licensed opportunities if the people are following state laws and he says a few he makes a few points in that in that memo he says that if the state uh, uh, enacts regulations forms a regulatory body, sets these laws and regulations and enforces them and legalizes uh, mar marijuana, then it's a federal, it's a Department of Justice position that we aren't going to touch it. And that's effectively what, what, the, what, the, what the memo says. Um, the big question has been with Sess Yes, go ahead, Laurel. Um, so when you said that uh, literally dozens open, I mean, describe that a little bit. Obviously, they were already selling. So I think those are some of the the questions, and there's just such a hesitation around people behaving. So when you said they open up overnight, literally people just knew the people who had the cultivations, got the product, already had the product. Um, what what they, really uh, happened? What really happened? in Colorado there are people that were already kind of in this gray area of the market they want they were around it in the fringes of it they wanted to open up but were doing it almost in secrecy and when the yep. co memo came out they came out in open and that was really in advance of the state setting the regulations in anticipation that the state of Colorado Colorado was now going to in was going to set regulations and enforce that in compliance with the co memo but because they were the first people to do it, they didn't have any regulations set up. And so it was kind of like a free for all. And there wasn't really an application process. There wasn't really, and to this day, the state of Colorado still suffers. They, they're constantly changing the regulations because they're really trying to catch up from never putting any in in the very first place and, and, and putting that in those controls in place. And so they've continually been adjusting 
these regulations to get them where they where they want them to be. But um, but that's where it started um, in '09 when these 1,100 popped up because under the medical laws in Colorado at the time, you were allowed to grow 12 plants for yourself if you're a medical patient, and you were allowed to grow for other people 12 plants if if they were medical patients. You could be their grower for them. And so people would would get medical cards from other people and they would get them to, to sign an authorization to allow them to grow for them. And then under the Colorado law, the way that it was is, is if I had an excess amount of product, I could then sell it to other people. And that's what the dispensaries were. But it created a problem. Um, in, it created a problem for a lot of dispensary owners because they had to become experts in growing, cultivating, uh, the product trimming, manufacturing, retail store, marketing to get the customers, and be financially sound to be able to run the whole business. So there, there are lots of challenges with that, but that was where the whole thing started in, in Colorado in, in, back in 2009. Um, we progressed far beyond that, though, from, yep. from, where, where, from where that initially started. Um, and and uh, in, Go ahead. The next, uh, the FinCEN uh, guidance, when did, when did that come in? So then the FinCEN guidance came in a, a, about three years ago, um, two or three years ago, I think it was in 2014. It's, it's, it's on the memo there, right there, I think in 2014. FinCEN is an organization that most people have never heard of. And what they, what they do, if you go look at their website, they're a government organization. They work with the Federal Reserve and with our banking system. And their primary responsibility is dealing with money laundering rules and laws and those types of things. And so when you're taking money, cash business, and you're a bank, you're not allowed to take it from a illegal source. You know, you, you, you can't go out and deal in arms, sell them to Iran and sell for a whole bunch of cash and take it to your bank and deposit it. Somebody's going to go to jail for that. And so it's the same thing with marijuana. It was a federally illegal thing. So banks weren't touching it. And it created a problem. So FinCEN came out, and 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 I got and I got that memo probably five minutes after it came out from a a fairly prominent senator in the in the United States Senate. Sent it to me, and 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 the, it was it was attached, and it said um, actually came from his assistant, and he said it looks like the the banking problems have been solved. I quickly opened it up. I got a whole bunch of phone calls from a lot of people saying the banking problems have been solved. I read the memo and very quickly saw that it didn't solve the banking problems. It solved it to a certain degree, but effectively what it says is that banks, we, you, it's okay for you to bank uh, marijuana. In fact, Bank of America banks more marijuana companies than anybody in the entire country. But when they do that, they have to report to the federal government that they're banking for a marijuana enterprise. That's how we know Bank of America does more than anybody because they put out a, FinCEN put out a report last year. By, and they listed all the banks that are opening accounts and how many accounts that they have. We were one of those. We used to have an account at Bank of America. And what the report says is that, is that the bank, you can bank these customers as long as they are following the state law. Here was a caveat, though, that it still yeah. creates this problem with it. The caveat was this, is that if the client of the bank, the marijuana dispensary, is violating the law, so if I own a dispensary and I'm buying marijuana from Mexico from Hugo Chavez, importing it from Mexico, and I'm selling it, and I'm taking that cash and then depositing it in Bank of America, Bank of America could lose their charter and could be held criminally liable for allowing me to do that. It's money laundering. So the problem that most people suffer with is not having the right relationships with the bank. And even if you have the right relationships, it's still challenging and difficult. But the banks are doing it, and they're doing it more and more as they get more and more comfortable with operators that are following the law. And there's, there's a fair number of us that have banking that are in the industry, but that's what the, that's what the issue is about. It's about... It's about the relationship with the bank and the bank and the reason why there's still problems is because the bank can be held liable if I, as a, as a dispensary owner, violate the law and I get prosecuted by the government for breaking the law, the bank could be charged along with me. 
and uh, and that's why it didn't solve 100 percent the banking the banking problem but that's the fence and guidance I, I gave you all a link so you can read it again for yourself and if somebody's really bored to to read a whole bunch of pages of of uh, fence and regulations <laughs> So, well, so I think the key the key is that as long as the everyone's doing what they need by the law, but there's no real compliance to that in the industry at this point. Is that that's typically part of it as well, correct? Yeah. So the banks that are banking, the the ideal world is a bank will come in and 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 do some compliance checks to make sure if the bank wants to 100% absolve itself of any liability, they need to do that. I'm on, in Colorado, there are a few banks that are doing that. Uh, there's nobody in Nevada. Uh, there's nobody in California. There are banks that are banking people, but I'm not aware of any of these audits that are going, that are taking place. But that's, if a bank wants to take it to a full level, we, we did a, I was involved in, a, in another transaction. It's a, it's a marijuana related business that is providing, working on providing banking solutions to companies the, this bank president that we were working with, uh, m meeting with the the head of the, of the Federal Reserve in uh, San Francisco for the region with the team, and they said that and their, their response was, this is the first totally compliant system. So the bank can do it, but most banks lack probably the interest more than anything in the, in the, the feeling to do it, and they're more going off of the relationships with the client and if they're comfortable with the client and with the industry as a whole. And there are select banks that are doing it. Yep. So I don't want to dwell on it too much, but um, that's that's it in a nutshell. It, what do you think, Laurel? Any other questions with that? Is that no, I, yeah, let's move to the next slide on just the ownership regulations and just is it, you know, federal laws, are they good, bad for the industry, for you? Like, I don't think, I think people are so used to federal regulations and how that's working that to leave it in the hands, and I know you and I have had this conversation, but you know, have that perspective of the value of keeping it really at the local levels. Yeah, my yeah, my this is my this is my opinion. My opinion is that because it's illegal federally, what that means is from a business, and most of you I'm sure you're aware, if I'm in the state of Nevada doing business, I have to grow and sell my product within the state of Nevada, intrastate commerce. I'm not allowed to do interstate commerce. I can't take my product, grow it here, and sell it in Colorado or California. If I do that, then I'm violating, violating federal laws. So some people I hear talk about, oh man, we can't wait until the federal government legalizes it totally. I say, the longer they take, the better it is for us, people like you and me. And the reason that is, is because when they open it up federally and it's open, you know, for anybody to compete, that's when you're going to get massive co competition from massive players. Philip Morris's of the world, large pharmaceutical companies. Those guys are staying out of the business. It also creates opportunities within the state. The state of Nevada, as an example, there's a, there's a, the large, there's two of the largest companies out in Colorado. They're doing business here in Nevada. But when they came to Nevada to start doing business, they had to start on the exact same finish line, even as everybody else. Even though they had been running for seven years in Colorado, were doing tens of millions of dollars a year in, in, in revenues, they had to be, they were a brand new startup company here in Nevada, as they would be in California, as they would be in Oregon and Washington. So it creates opportunities for all of us to be in the exact same position as them. Now, do they have more experience than some? Certainly. Do they maybe have more money than others? Certainly. But they have to go in and compete with the, the most prominent brand in Colorado is really struggling with getting any market share here in Nevada. To be honest with you, they're, they're really struggling with, with getting much market. They're doing a little bit better now, but for the last year, they've been virtually non-existent. And, uh, and that's for a variety of reasons, but, but that's why I think that this is a good thing. So uh, for, for uh, the, the, the chaos, I guess, I think there's opportunity in chaos, in, if, if you want to call it that. Um, yeah. that if, yeah. what, what's that, Laurel? Totally agree. Totally Do you agree, agree with that? So that that's where we find these opportunities, and and that's why you've got this green rush, and that's why there's you know these you know all these nuggets of opportunities for us to come in and, and take advantage of and, and to capitalize them, and to find the opportunity. At some point down the road, as the market gets developed, and then the federal government legalizes, 
that's when you'll see these big conglomerates will come in and you'll see a lot of acquisitions going on in the space with those that have gone in and have developed market share branding niche businesses that are servicing the industry then you'll want people want to will want to create this these national brands these national services and uh, and that's where there's going to be lots of exit op in my opinion there'll be lots of exit opportunities for lots of people um, when that comes in place but in the meantime uh, it creates lots of opportunities for us yep absolutely so what, um, sort of, what are the states that are permit you know that are uh, allowing it what are the you know the pertinent information on the state regulations at this point so there's uh, you know I mean look anybody can do a Google search and see that there's roughly 30 states in the country that have some sort of legalization of marijuana or recreational for my purposes in in what my belief is in in the country of where the opportunities are and there are like there are niche opportunities but um but each one comes with its with its own unique circumstances uh, let's start with colorado because that's probably the most uh prolific one the highest profile one when colorado started the reason why i backed out of those transactions that we had in, in under contract was because the law in the state of colorado at that time you had to be a resident for two years of the state of colorado to have any direct ownership or financial controls in a medical in, into a marijuana enterprise I wasn't a two-year resident of the state of Colorado, nor were any of my partners. And so the only way for us to take down that enterprise was to put up a nominee person that would be a resident of the state of Colorado, have them pretend to be the owner for us. We put up the money, and then at some point in the road, we'd have to get, move our residency to Colorado, wait two years, and then we could become the legal owner of it all in the meantime hoping we can contractually tie it down well enough that we don't get you know lose our shirts in the in the investment that we were doing and you're talking millions of dollars so it's not like you're talking even a hundred thousand dollars you're talking millions of dollars and so um it was it was it was something we're comfortable with it from a financial perspective but the other reason i wasn't comfortable with it is remember that cold memo the Cole memo says, as long as you're following state law, we as a federal government have no issue have no issue with you. Well, the state law says you have to be a resident two years. So, was it worth it to circumvent that law and you know pretend that I wasn't you know that I wasn't the legal owner of this enterprise? And the answer to that question for me was no. And uh, and so we we backed out of it. A lot of people have done that; they've had no issues with it. But for me. For our group, we weren't comfortable with that risk, and we backed out. We also felt like that Nevada was going to be a better opportunity, is going to be on the starting line of of with everybody, and and it was going to and it will be, according to all the projections, equal to in size or potentially bigger in Colorado. The other reason why we like Nevada is, um, well, actually, let me save that till I, I move on with it. So that's. So that's a residency requirement. I'm going to come back to Nevada and those things later on. But in uh, so, the residency, so ben, that, is, that's is, the issue is that with Colorado. Currently, yes. And is that currently still the law in Colorado? Because I've, you know, that is that you still have to be a resident. And and just in general, from what I've heard, and again, I'm kind of speaking probably for the voice of a lot of the folks out there, and I'm sure this question is running uh, over to Thomas. Is it really? I mean, it is still intrastate in the product to the dispensary the investors have to be in the state is that pretty much what it is i mean still in colorado going to be in nevada going to be in a lot of the states so in colorado they have loosened up that regulation um but they haven't totally opened it up and in preparation of this call yesterday i had my attorney contact the marijuana division of colorado because i was curious if they were changing it or anything and they told us that they're they have no plans of changing it at this time but what the rule essentially says is that if you have an outside uh, a re an investor in the company, a non-Colorado resident, um, then you can have a maximum of 15 total shareholders in the company unless you are a qualified, there's, there's some exemptions, banks, investment companies, and so forth. There's a limitation on what percentage they can own. 
there's also a limitation on being officers and directors in the company. So there is some allowances of ownership. It's pretty limited, um, but there is some. Oregon, Washington, they haven't, uh, uh, I haven't checked lately, but they have, uh, they have residency requirements and so does Arizona. So you, you've got to be, you have to be a resident of the state of Arizona or Oregon or Washington. I, I, I always get them reversed, but Oregon is one day and Washington, you have to be a 90 day resident. So it's pretty quick, but you do have to be a resident of the state. And what that makes it, it, Arizona, you do have to. Now, Nevada did not put that requirement in place. The, the gentleman that wrote the laws are Lieutenant Governor uh, uh, Mark Hutchison. I know him personally and, and, I, and I, when we started this process, went and had lunch with him and and he told me he told us directly he said the reason why we did not put that requirement in our law is that we didn't think we we didn't want the litigation over it and we didn't think it could stand withstand the nevada constitution and uh and so they did not require nevada residency the state of california in their draft regulations they haven't yet to come out with their formal their, their final regulations but in their draft regulations there is no residency requirements in the state of california uh pennsylvania doesn't have any residency requirements florida does i i ohio doesn't but they're but those states are very challenging there's a very only a handful of licenses it's purely medical uh, they've already been applied for and or given out. Pennsylvania, they've already given out. There will be some more opportunities down the road. It'll be interesting to watch that market to see how it develops. But the we feel like that the lowest hanging fruit are Nevada and California um, on the on the re residency requirements uh, for those reasons. Plus, you've got phenomenally large markets that are developing and, and rapidly growing, and both legal for recreational. Um, so let's head yes, back well. to the slide. So resident requirements, application licenses available, kind of speak to kind of each of these, you know, points. So from that, the financial is, um, it's kind of blended. The one that I think is going to be uh, shocking for a lot of people is the background checks too. So I'll let you kind of speak to those points. Okay, perfect. So okay. most of these states, uh, Colorado, uh, again, going back to Colorado, Washington, Oregon, because there were the three kind of early prominent states. There's no limitation on licensing um, issues. Nevada, there was a window of opportunity to apply. There were limits on dispensary licenses. There weren't limits on the other licenses. However, they don't currently take applications. So if you wanted to have any kind of license in the state of Nevada, you can't even get one. You'd have to do business with somebody that has one already. And where those opportunities create, now Pennsylvania um, issued about 25 licenses in, in total. Um, those licenses have been issued. Um, Ohio's doing about the same number. Again, those have all been applied for. Um, California, there's not going to be a limit on the on the opportunities. It's not the residency requirement, and there's not going to be a limit on it. But uh, that that brings in a whole different set of opportunities. All of these states typically have some sort of financial requirement. The state of Nevada, you had to have a quarter of a million dollars in the bank just to apply. Um, the state of Utah is working on some regulations. I've seen some draft regulations. They're talking about having a $2 million uh, uh, cash requirement. So each one of these have, have financial requirements. The processes are very tedious. They're very competitive. The dispensary license that we uh, received here in Las Vegas, we had 47 applicants and we were chosen at, in, in, in our area, we were chosen of one of 47 applicants. So they're, they can be very competitive depending upon where you, where you are. Um, I am gonna, I'm meeting with, uh, last night I had dinner with, a, with a, the mayor of a town in California. Next Wednesday, I'm meeting with the city council of another town. They're gonna issue 12 licenses in the town that I'm meeting with next Wednesday. Um, and, uh, and they're gonna be issuing these, these dispensary licenses. So we're gonna compete for those and, and, and go through that process. And all of these require FBI background checks. So to be a direct owner, a shareholder in the company, you have to go through a background check. In most states, it's in, in, Nevada is probably the clearest cut. It's just simply in most of the states are this way. Basically, if you have been convicted of a drug dealing conviction in the last decade, although Washington doesn't take into account any marijuana related convictions, actually. 
Um, uh, so if you've had any drug dealing convicts, felony convictions or violent crimes, you're disqualified from being um, a shareholder uh, and, and even working in the industry. So that's where the background check comes into, into play. And, and, and some states require very extensive, Colorado requires very extensive um, background check processes. Even someplace in Las Vegas, some jurisdictions, the city of Las Vegas is a nightmare to do business with. They do the same background check as if you were owned a casino and they want not only your personal information, but they want your kids' personal information and your parents' personal information. Um, all of all of their financial all, all their financial information and background the history. So, but for the states, it's it's not that intrusive. Um, it's mainly a background check and some, maybe some additional questions, if depending upon what types of litigation or what kind of challenges you you may have had in your in your past. So that that is a process and and one that definitely has has to be dealt with. It's one reason why I like from an investing standpoint to have investors come in at in into transactions where they are debt because if you're a debt um, holder to the company not an equity then you don't have to go through the background check right. now maybe you have the right to convert into equity down the road so you get the benefits of that i don't know if, if anybody if anybody on this call has had much experience with that but let's say you loaned a company a um, hundred dollars and that hundred dollars had the right to convert into one share um, or into 100 shares let's uh, say 100 shares so is that really any different than receiving the 100 shares of stock? It's really the same, but it gives a time for you to invest into the deal now, go through the background checks, and, uh, and, and convert it at whatever time is convenient for you to convert that into equity into the transaction, or take the debt and, and take the payment back on your debt for your investment. Well, and I think part of what we'll be offering, you know, to some as we're putting our together, I mean, that's, you know, and I know a lot of you are asking and you're emailing and, to, you know, Damon and the team. And uh, those are some of the conversations Ben and I are having is do we do a convertible debt note? Um, some of you have asked, you know, can you just do part of the land and the, the warehousing, the construction for 1031 exchanges? So we're, we're clear just so you, you know, we're, I'm hearing and Ben, we're, we've been talking about how we're going to do the offering. I think by next week we'll be, probably more set to have that conversation exactly what we're going to be doing um right yep. now we just want to educate you and let you know so let's yeah, get just, it. let's um, go ahead I, I just say one other thing with that the real estate owner doesn't have to go through a background check so you could be a partner in the in the real estate that the tenant or the the you know the, the tenant inside is the operator so maybe get a nice return from the real estate perspective be a part of the industry but with not having to go through that that background perfect okay. yeah. go ahead yep okay. so uh, market size potential there are states that are pertinent we've kind of gone through some of them we want to talk about canada kind of at the end of that next slide yeah so you know i've, I've already talked a little bit about some of these states um you know i, I you know most of these states are, ver are very challenging to do unless you are a resident of those states and some of them are just very small. Um, it's impossible to get a license in New York. It's impossible to get a license in Maine. Virtual, imp virtually impossible. There's not really markets that you know you can do. Hawaii is the same way. Hawaii gave licenses out. They gave like ten of them out. Um, and as you can imagine, they'd be very well connected local people that got them. I can't remember one of the. I was told to one of the people were that you would, if I can remember who it is, you would be like, oh yeah, of course you would get one there. Um, but, you know, so Colorado, Washington, Oregon, we talked about the residency issues. We feel like, I mean, I feel like California, Nevada, Canada are where, are where some phenomenal, phenomenal opportunities. Uh, Nevada, for the reasons I've stated, it's a massive market. You can allow out-of-state ownership. We have 45 million visitors a year that come here. Where else do you go in the world to pay $25 for a martini on the strip? And, you know, don't blink an eye. You probably complain about it when you go home. You're, you're here, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. People do things in here that they don't normally do, perhaps in their daily lives. Um, I think that's a fair statement. I think most people would agree with, agree with that statement. I read a report by the state of Colorado when they, were pro, when they were proposing to legalize marijuana. So this is a few years ago. And they hired um, somebody like McKinsey and company to to do an analysis of how many people wanted to buy recreational marijuana 
And they broke it down into different groups, male, female, and I, I don't remember all the numbers, but I do remember this number. Um, the total number of adults that they expected to consume either on a daily basis or on an occasional basis, once a month. The, the lowest category was, I believe, it was an occasional category, maybe a, a monthly, a quarterly kind of thing. 18% was a number that they estimated of adults in, in Colorado would uh, consume marijuana, at least on an occasional recreational basis. So when I take that number and I think, okay, there's 45 million people that come to Las Vegas, I think you should all ask yourself one question and that I ask myself, and that is what percentage of the 45 million people that might smoke on, a, on an occasional basis, would they do that when they're in Las Vegas? And I got to believe the answer to that question is yes. And that's <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Quite high. Quite high. <laughs> I mean, you know, crazy guess. So that's roughly 9 million people um, that are tourists that come in town, not to mention the, the 2 million people that live here and, you know, that will be on a more regular basis, another 400,000 or so that will be more regular consumers. And, 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 and that's why I like the opportunity here. And there's also a limit. I mentioned the limited number of licenses. Let me put it, let me put it in comparison for you. One of the dispensers we had in escrow was in the city of Colorado Springs and Colorado Springs has a population of about 450,000 people. Somebody wants to Google that and fact check me on that. It's somewhere in there. In, uh, and in Colorado Springs, at the time, there were approximately 70 dispensaries in, within the city proper. Within the entire uh, southern Nevada, Metro, Clark County, Las Vegas, there are 46 dispensaries. We have a population of two and a half million people, two million people, excuse me, two and a half statewide. About 2 million people here, plus 45 million visitors that come here. So when you look at from the, the amount of dispensaries as a ratio to the number of the, of the population, it pales in comparison. It's, it's just not even in the same ballpark. Then when you, then when you add on top of that, um, the, uh, then you look at the cultivation size. In the city proper of Denver, Colorado, there's no, nearly 6 million square feet of indoor cultivation space. In the entire state of Nevada, there's about a million licensed. And so when you look at the market sizes, there are similar sized markets. And if you wanted to go build, so when Colorado started going crazy, massive money dumped in there, hundreds of millions of dollars. Pueblo County, if anybody knows, Colorado, all Pueblo County legalized for outdoor grow and for greenhouses, and they have acres and acres and acres of greenhouses and outdoor growing, massive amounts, hundreds of thousands of square, people were building 100, 200,000 square foot warehouses throughout the state. I'm talking just a city of Denver proper, you know, the Denver Metro is a big area. I'm talking proper city of Denver, not the suburbs five to six million square feet of cultivation space. So that's where I think the opportunity is. Then look at Colorado, California, and there already is a multi-billion dollar industry. They say it's going to be $22 billion a year, the industry of a whole, by the year 2020 or 2022 in the state of California. And then you look at it and you say, okay, there's already a whole bunch of people there, and there are a whole bunch of people there. But you know what they're going to have to do starting next year that they've never had to do before for the last 25 years? They're going to have to do comply with regulations. They're going to have to get business licenses. What does that mean? That means the fire department is going to come in and inspect their facilities and make sure they're safe. Anybody have ever done that before? They're a pain in the ass. They're going to have to go in and do the, do the construction process. They're going to have to get building permits, business licenses. And when they get their product grown, they're going to have to pass a test. Right now, they have to pass a test. And they're going to have to pass a test that says it doesn't have mildews and molds and bad pesticides, anything negative for you. Most people believe that almost everything in the state of California will fail according to the standards that the state of Nevada has. And the proposed regulations in the state of California are equally as strict, in fact, slightly more strict than the state of Nevada. 
So you look at these people out there that are running and operating, and yes, they're there, but they are going to have to completely change their business, which means they're probably going to have to gut out and rebuild their, a lot of these facilities. In order to comply, they won't, probably will not even be able to make it with what they currently have a lot of them. There was an article just about a month ago, the sheriff of Humboldt County, he said they have 4,000 illegal girls in Humboldt County alone. And he, his words were, we will be lucky if we have 500 of them become legal. Every single dispensary is no longer going to be able to grow, purchase from a, a grower any longer. Right now, the way it works, a guy shows up with a backpack. He grows it in his house, his backyard, or whatever he, his farm. He throws it in his truck. He puts it in his backpack. He walks in the dispensary, shows it what he's got, and he sells it. That's no longer going to exist. There's going to be third-party dispense uh, distributors that have to pick up the product from any grower or manufacturer um, of edibles or oils and so forth. And it has to be a third-party distributor that's going to have to deliver all that product to the dispensaries and from the cultivators. So it's kind of this chaos theory, in my belief, that in California, why I think it's an amazing opportunity is there already is a multi-billion-dollar market. And of the multi-billion-dollar market, probably 25% of it is going to be able to comply with the new regulations. The downside is there's no limit on the licenses, but that's also the opportunity. Yes, Laurel, go ahead. Uh, so there's also like by the end of uh, this year, those who have had, whether it's a delivery license or some license, I mean, everyone from, again, this is information, misinformation. That's why I'm asking the question to clear it up for those that are out there is, uh, do they have to reapply? So for example, you know, right here on the lake, there's only one license because the other ones got risky and because we live right on state line between Nevada and California, kept delivering product to Nevada when it wasn't legal. And those guys had their license, you know, licenses taken away. There's one guy now on the California side. Will they really be grandfathered in? How is that? Because I would think they have a new opportunity to do the financial requirements and actually like Colorado did, make an enormous amount of money as a state or right on the on the opportunity but those who have licenses are they going to all have to go up for renewal will there be a grandfather what do you know about that a little bit of both um and, and a little bit of the third which is nobody knows um the state <laughs> has put out draft regulations they're draft anybody that can anybody that says this is definitively what's going to happen in the state of california is making guesses that simply they may be guessing right or may not be guessed right and most of them will be guessing wrong i i it was it was such a fascinating process i wish we could in nevada if we had time to talk about it but in nevada and we were working closely with the people that were actually making the regulations here a few years ago and it would be amazing to me how many meetings i would go to and people i would talk to and they would tell me things even still to this day they would come in they would tell me things of, of this is what the state's going to do. And I'd look at them and, and I would think, and I would, I would always ask, well, how do you know that? And they're like, oh, well, that's just, that's just how they're going to do it. And I'm thinking, oh, I was just talking to the guy that's actually putting that out. And he told me the exact opposite. So there's a lot of mis misinformation that goes out there. A lot of rumors, a lot of BS. Some of it's true. Some of it's not true. Most of it is all speculation as to what is going to happen. The truth, the only tr truth is, is that, there is a set of draft regulations. They are sparse. There are, they are going to start public hearings here shortly. The, the formal regulations are due January 1st. Um, I don't think they're going to make January 1st, but sometime next year, first quarter, maybe second quarter, the final draft regulations that are in there. In those draft regulations, it says that if you have an existing business license, and this goes to the people you're talking about right now, you have an existing business license in the state of California, then we're gonna get those people processed first. And that's in the draft regulation. So if they, if they live to that and keep that, then the existing licensee holders, if you will, the ones that have local business licenses and are operating, will, get, uh, will be the first ones to actually get the formal state business licenses issued. Okay. That answer the question? No, yep, it sure did. Thomas, are there any, I know we've been going for a while, but I'm also going to pick up our pace. I just realized, like, I could talk about this for hours because that's what I do. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, I want to go to the financing of facilities and show some of the uh, the cultivation. So, Thomas, if you want to put up that slide, if there's uh, some burning questions, let's go to those really quick. 
Sure. So, Ben, right now we have a picture, I believe, of the indoor hydroponic up. Um, before we get to that real quick, we've had a number of people ask about um, Texas and specifically what's going on with that state. Uh, can you speak to that at all? Um, I, 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 let me first say I can't speak to um, great authority to it other than what I hear from the industry and people I talk to. Uh, and what I hear from Texas is that if it's going to be coming, it's, it's going to be a ways down the road. There may be some medical laws that may be coming. Obviously, a very conservative state like Utah. And I, I do know Utah is a neighboring state, and I happen to know the people there well. But the polls in most of those states are overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive for medical uh, marijuana. And But uh, from my understanding, is Texas is is uh, nowhere near on the radar at this point of, of legalizing. Okay. And then can you talk real quick um, about Canada? We brought it up a little bit on the last slide, but uh, some people um, wanted to uh, know what your thoughts were on, on the opportunities in Canada. Canada's great. Um, the entire country is going to be legalizing. There's still Trudeau is the prime minister there. Um, he They have said that they're going to legalize before and some there's a couple of times where they they were supposed to come forth with regulations already that they're behind on, but they are going to legalize. There's going to be more opportunity in Canada, and I think one of the unique opportunities in Canada is not just it's 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 a it's like it's a it's basically the state of California. So it's uh, over again, you know. So there's a tremendous opportunity up there. Canadians love their marijuana, and the other thing that's great about Cal Canada is you can export. So there's a lot of countries, Germany, um, I'm talking directly to the country of Ireland and the United Kingdom right now. They are legalizing for medical, but they have no way to grow it. So we can grow, we can import it from Canada, as an example, into Ireland or into the UK. Germany, you can as well into the pharmacy. So you can get this other business and Canada is probably the only place in the world outside of Israel, I guess, that you can do that, um, do that with. So there's some interesting international opportunities in Canada as well as the domestic ones in Canada. Awesome. Yeah, no, if you want to talk a little bit about the different uh, financing, the different facilities, again, we are getting close to the uh, end of the hour here. I know we want to try and get as much as we can. Yep. Um, I believe the first slide we have is an image of an indoor hydroponic uh, facility. Ben, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, those, uh, what you're looking at are some pictures of that is actually um, a facility we built, an indoor facility. You're looking at uh, flowers of, um, I apologize, I don't have the, the screen in, in, in front of me, uh, Thomas. So are you showing all the pictures that I sent, all four of the pictures? Um, no, we, we just do, we have one from the indoor hydroponic facility uh, with the orange lights um, and the big fans. And then we will have okay. one for the greenhouse and one for the outdoor operation. Okay, so what you're looking at there, that, that picture is the flowering room. So those are plants that are in there. I, I just kind of want to point out if you can see it, the floor, the cleanliness, the organization. It's pure hydroponic. There's no dirt in the facility. Um, those plants are, are, are flowering. And so they spend, in our case, they spend nine weeks in flowering. Indoor facilities, um, hydroponic facilities are the most expensive to build. They also produce a highest quality product that commands the most amount of money. So, um, you know, you have your building cost, whatever that ends up being, and then you have your, your build out cost, which can be anywhere from, you know, a, a $125, number, $125 a square foot, usually a number that's kind of thrown out in the industry. You can easily spend more than that, and you can be cheap and probably spend a little bit less than that. Um, so, there is no outside financing. So you can't go to the bank and borrow the money, not even for the real estate on these things. So um, all the money that's going into these is either private, it is, all, is, is all private money. So it's private lenders, um, uh, syndicates of individual investors that are all going into them. So that's the, that is the indoor facility. The biggest thing that I, I mean, I like indoor because um, indoor, indoor in California, an indoor hydroponic uh, pound of weed will command neighborhood of $2,000 and a greenhouse grown marijuana is going to only command 1400, 1500 for top quality. Some is 900, a thousand. Personally, I think it's a bad rap, but because people perceive it as well, it's cheaper to grow. 
And so therefore, I'm going to pay less money for it. And you can tell the difference between it. You can see the difference. It's a whole other discussion. But, but generally, for the most part, an experienced person can look at a bud and tell if it's grown indoor, outdoor, or in a greenhouse. The biggest difference, what I... Yep. Again, go ahead, uh, Thomas, and put the the greenhouse picture as well, which is on the next slide, and then continue, you know, do with the, dis the the distinctions between the hydroponic and the greenhouse. So in the in the in the in a hydroponic indoor, we're going to get about five point in a well-run hydroponic facility. You're going to get about 5.7 harvest per year out of that. You're going to harvest um, every 63 days, approximately. The Major difference is your initial capital cost, and then on your operational cost, your big difference is your power. Um, in our facility, our power, we produce, it costs us about $100 a pound extra to grow indoor than if I were to grow in a greenhouse. So I spend $100 in power, but I'm selling it for $500 to $1,000 more a pound. So to me, it's a no-brainer. Um, that's why I like the indoor hydroponic. Greenhouses are also fantastic. They also have their use. What's great is you grow a lower cost product um, to, to grow it. Uh, you can bring your cost down in it. That is a, our greenhouse in Northern California, my partner's green uh, that we have up there. Uh, you can see the top of that. It's got, uh, you can see a dark streak down the middle of that. Those go down because the every single day, because we control the light. They're called light light depot so they they deprive the plants of the light and that's what those greenhouses do they're rel those are relatively inexpensive greenhouses um and uh again a little bit lower product low grade product a little bit less expensive to to produce in a greenhouse you're going to get two to three harvests per year um, out of a greenhouse if you do really work it and you do heating and air conditioning you can probably get another you know maybe four to five and outdoors move to the next one Obviously, you have no infrastructure build out, watering systems and that kind of thing, negligible, the land cost, certainly a much less expensive operation. You're growing outdoors, you get one harvest a year. The plants are big. Those plants you're looking at are about eight feet tall. That, that picture was taken about two weeks ago. Yeah, if anybody wants to go with us up in Northern California and see those plants, you're welcome to go with us. That, that, uh, um, they produce each one of those plants. We're going to get eight pounds of marijuana off each you know, off of each one of those. So you'll you know again. So but it's a lower grade product. It's subject to the wind, the rain, the bugs outside, and that you know, that all produces a lower grade product. But you can sell as flour, and we can also make oils and edibles. And greenhouses and outdoor grills, especially, are even unless unless our stuff is great. Listen, my our, my partner and grower is the best. He's one of the uh, for an outdoor greenhouse grower. He honestly, I believe he's he's as good as they get. So his product really can have the great price. But most guys growing in greenhouses and outdoors, they're going to want to uh, cut that product down and make oils and edibles from that product, which is a great business model. Um, let's see here. You want to talk about the dispensaries a little bit there as well, Ben? Yep. Dispensaries. Look, it's a retail store. So, you know, we, we uh, $100 a foot build out, just like with any retail store in your, in your square footage, you can go high end. Those of you that come and visit us in Vegas, we're going to take you to our dispensary. We believe we have the nicest dispensary in the world. Um, it really is. It comes in, it, look, it looks like the Four Seasons. We have a world-renowned interior designer that did it for us um and uh the design on it and uh, it is beautiful uh most dispensaries that you go to are done really on the cheap for it and but they're they're retail stores and um and and you got and your big expense is not only in the build out but in your operational expenses and your inventory your your six figures hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product to stock your shelves as you as you can imagine is, is expensive to get in there you got to have the variety so that's that's what I would tell you on the on the on the dispensary side of it. And again, the most of the retail stores. What I like about all of these is we try to get the property, and we don't we can't do this in every case. But the collateral of buying the real estate so that we include it in everything. So the, the real estate is the underlying asset. And uh, and in some of these, like in a retail store, our our dispensary, we don't own this. It's a shopping center and. We try to buy it. They won't sell it. They've owned it for 60 years, and they won't sell it to us. 
um, at three generations in the family, and uh, it's two older ladies, and it's their it's their income. But that, but you know sometimes you can't you can't buy them. We have a great location, but we we do try to we we do try to buy the facilities. We own the and control the asset, so we give that we give that uh, that that collateral um, uh, for all of us uh, to help secure all of us in whatever we're doing with that. Um, financing you, these? Yes, go ahead. How do you, so with just the different ways from the growth facilities, the royalties, equity. And then next week, we are going to get further into that conversation as well as uh, get to the political side of how how to even get the license done. So talk about the financing, and then uh, we're going to talk about our tour a little bit more, we, more detail. Sounds great. Financing, like in any business that you're doing, of course, you do whatever options that you have available. As as there is in the marijuana industry, there's there's not the traditional banking for the real estate and those types of businesses. So you're looking at investors, individual investors. How how can that be appealing uh, to to an investor to participate in that, taking into account the risk of the the risk of the investment, the risk of the enterprise. You know, can we buy the real estate? Can we own the real estate? Um, you know, you've got heavy operational expenses in these in these businesses. Um, I, and and so for most of the investors that are coming in, they're more I would call them more passive investors. They there's a, a lot of heaviness into the management and the and like the operational side of it. So for me, I like. Um, I, I've seen it done all kinds of different ways. There's a straight equity um, deal, of course. It's you know whatever everybody agrees to. You know, put this money in, you're going to get this much equity in the deal. Uh, there is debt. Lend the money, I'm going to get paid a, a certain rate of return. Uh, typical real estate deal. It's a great way to do it. Third way to do it is uh, maybe a debt with a with a with a with a with a small piece of of uh, of equity. Uh, as a kicker for that, um, one one way that I like I haven't seen anybody else do is a is what I call a royalty with a, with an equity kicker. And so it works like a rate of return. It gives it gives the investor more of the upside of the deal. So it, 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 the investor gets as the business does better, the investor gets a higher return. We we do it based on industry. Norm. So if it performs at just regular numbers, you know, it's a pretty predictable ROI. If we bring down a harvest and you get twice as much product out of the harvest, that twice as much money is being passed on through to the investor, plus a piece of an equity kicker to that, or that kicks over in, or that converts over into equity. So um, those are the ways that I've seen it and the way that I like to do it. And then those are, then, then it's based on obviously the total size of the package and the amount of the, of the investment that, that is in there. Laurel? So now I think, uh, let's go to some questions and then I think uh, you know, we'll talk a little more about, uh, Ben and I spent a fair amount of time with our team on really building out our October 19, 20 and 21. Uh, can, it's really, we're calling it investing and building the cannabis industry uh, you know, tour and uh, there's several opportunities. But before we jump over there and uh, Tell you our updates. So, Thomas, what are the questions are out there? Sure. So right now we've had a number of people who have asked about um, investing, and you know, uh, some, uh, we've had this question come up a couple times. What is the uh, initial cost to start or, or get invested with the production uh, business? Um, uh, in your in your experience, Ben, what does that usually take to get involved? Uh, for a production license, particularly, or the, um, the uh, generally a, a marijuana business. I uh, uh, speak to both of those. Um, you can speak, Ben, to what we're looking at raising. I mean, we've talked around, you know, five to eight million on our first raise of what we're looking at. So as far as uh, you know, how we're going to start getting into it, is that kind of what they're looking for? Or yeah, I think uh, yeah. 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 So, so you, 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 yeah. You can build them. Um, think of it as like an apartment complex. You can build a, you can build one condo, or you can build a hundred condos. Obviously, if you build a hundred, it's going to cost a lot more than if you build one. Um, so you build based on the according to the market size and demand in terms of what you think and 
and the market can handle easily and conservatively and how you can take advantage of that. And so for me, I like, and what we've talked about is, is about for people, I, I, I say 20, 25,000 square foot facilities, you know, they're six, five, six, seven, eight million dollars to build out small enough that it, that it, it's, it's relatively easily managed, but big enough that it can put out some pretty good product with room to grow so that you can continue to put more capital into it and, and, and build onto that as the market grows. Cause these markets are growing. So you don't want to build it all today for a market that's less, right? So, but as a market grows, the state of Nevada projects that the Nevada market this year is going to grow 5% compounding every single month. Well, I wouldn't want to have an operation to support and growing for what the, the industry is going to be like in two years from now. It's going to be double what it is today. And so if, if we build it too far ahead of ourselves, then, then um, we're going to have a more difficult time moving that product. And so, so that's why I like those, those sides of facilities because I think anywhere you can go in and in that niche. And you hear, you hear these, I don't know if you guys hear these, but I hear these crazy stories. I was just in, uh, like in California yesterday and I, I, I talked to the guy, and I, you know, there's, there's rumors that somebody's going to put some trust fund kid is, gonna, is building a million square feet of cultivation space, which nobody believes. But how would you even, if you think about it from a business standpoint, how would you overnight build that and then operate it and then sell it? So we like things that are going to be big enough that you can scale and grow into that business as you develop the market and the distribution and the branding of that product. So that's why I like those sizes of deals. And then putting multiple of them together in different regions and different, different areas. Production, production labs are a little bit less expensive than that. Um, that's why I asked about the production. You know, again, you can build them relative, you know, half, a million, two million dollars, three million dollars, um, depending upon um, all the bells and whistles you do and, and how big of a facility you build it. Dispensary, we were about a million dollars in our dispensary, um, but that's awfully nice. So I don't know that you need to spend that much on a, on a build out, but uh, we, we went, we went out a little more um, than we probably should have, <laughs> but we wanted it to be nice. It was our it was our flagship, so we we wanted to send a message to the market. I have one more okay. question. Michelle asks: Is there a limit to the amount of marijuana you could grow within a facility? I'm assuming, besides um, you know, obviously space constraints, are there regulations from government as to how much you can grow? That's a great question, and that is a state by state issue. And the short answer is y yes and no. Uh, Nevada has a limitation, but their limitation is to the size of your real estate. Uh, Colorado used to have, and they still do have some licenses that have uh, plant count limits. So you have a, a, a license, you're allowed to grow a certain number of plants. They've also gotten these larger licenses now where you have an unlimited number of plants. And again, that's more like a Nevada one, but they have these different levels. Washington is the same way. The largest indoor grow license in the state of Washington, for example, is about 30,000 square feet. They have an unlimited one, but it's meant for outdoor, the outdoor farmers in Washington. California, again, stick to my original answer. Nobody knows, but in the draft, for sure, but in the draft regulations, Another reason why California is great and that size I just mentioned is a great size. In the draft regulations, the maximum amount you can have is 22,000 square feet of canopy space in a cultivation facility. So that becomes a permanent, then what we wanna have is a whole bunch of investors that are in different individual growth facilities because the law is not gonna allow a single growth facility to be larger than 22,000 square feet. All right. Well, Laurel, I know you one, talked a little bit about wanting to let people know, uh, Ben talked about it earlier, about what's going on in Vegas. Uh, why don't we talk about that now? We are going to Vegas. <clears throat> so I want to clarify, because a lot of you uh, know that we do our Off Wall Street Asset three-day uh, tour. That's in September. So uh, Ben actually just you know, came down and saw the show in Dallas uh, this last month, this you know, a few weeks ago. So the Off Wall Street Assets is going on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. That's very, very different. Um, you know, that's with myself, Ben Williams, Rob, you know, our Lavelle Lab team. 
during that same time though, there will be a, a field trip. And those are the field trips uh, traditionally for head of the table or uh, big table folks, other people can pay to go to those as well. And that is gonna be seeing a multiple of operations. So uh, I have invited Ben to speak uh, and just you know, give some overview of the, of the cannabis business there. Uh, Flipping Wall Street will be uh, will be there. We're going to go out and see some commercial real estate. We're going to see an actual telemarketing sales floor, which many of you in business need, and to see one of those live. And then <clears throat> what you know, Ben Williams, I self direct. So there'll be five different companies, possibly one or two more. That will be uh, a field trip about the businesses and how those deals get done. Uh, just so you know, that's what that is. And totally different than in October will be our cannabis investing and building the cannabis industry uh, workshop. And this will be all cannabis related. So you're going to learn um, about the different opportunities in the industry. Again, just deeper dive into what our conversation during this webinar series is. And by the way, we have two more weeks of this. Um, we are going to have some demonstrations, uh, almost expo style of edible and extraction education. Uh, ben was sharing with us, we could maybe even get somebody to come in and actually do some cooking while they're there. Um, you know, we're assuming some of you are actually going to be uh, trying some product. Uh, we are going to go on a dispensary tour, the front side of the dispensary tour. And at the Friday night, we will be doing a VIP social. Um, and that, that will be for those of you who want to do the general admission at 500. I know many of you took advantage of that opportunity last week. Uh, if you want to just do the VIP social event, that Friday evening will be additional $97. And we're really working on a uh, so, Ben, if you want to speak to that Friday night, because I think you have some of the greatest ideas about that being the best party they've ever been to in Vegas. So, speak to that a little bit about the that bar. And, we and we, we did. Uh, What's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. We're gonna have, it's going to be fun. We have live music. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Yeah, we, we we did one we did one uh, uh, about a year ago at the dispensary. We we can't we can't do that as the as the dispensary, but Laurel can host a VIP party all day long, no problem. Um, but the uh, we 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 had uh, about 600 guests. Phenomenal. We had live entertainment. Uh, we had lots of education going on. It. We had this really cool venue, oh, uh, a bar, um, and uh, and lots of product education, uh, swag, and uh, just a lot of people interested, wanting to be involved in the business. That was a year ago. People are still talking about that event. It was, it was, it was a great party, great time, and uh, we'd love to do that do that again and, and just have a great party and great time with you guys. And a great opportunity to network among industry people and, you know, be able to talk about you know, about the culture, about the cannabis, and about the industry, and meet other like-minded people that are, um, that are doing the same or interested in doing the same. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking again, financing, investing, education. Um, I, th I think it's our plan is to have the opportunity ready, you know, by the September th uh, third week. Um, so that's still on. On and I know tons of you are asking, and we will. You will be the first to know because you're part of this whole series. Um, the VIP package. So we're going to be doing two levels of uh, admission. So the 500 is to the general admission, and um, that will be the Thursday, Friday and Saturday till around noon. If you want to add for $97 the VIP Friday night party, um, and that's really just to cover the, the cost of the kind of party that, that will be put on. Um, that's available if you really want to go out on private tours in groups of 10. So right now, you know, we're going to see what the interest level is, but you know, we're looking at maybe two groups of 10 uh, because you just can't go. And maybe Ben, you want to speak to you know, the sensitivity of having that many people into the, the private tours, but for the VIP package, you'll have actually a private cultivation tour. You'll have really a VIP back office experience of the dispensary tour. So you'll see the front with all with everyone, and then there'll be an additional, you know, going back and a deeper dive into the dispensary and how that operates and works. Uh, private lab tour, and then we'll be doing some roundtable discussions where you might be going, you know, out for lunch or on a break, and then we'll have some different uh, experts that'll have be at tables where you can have those conversations you want to have. Because a lot of you are, you know, some of you want career changes, some of you are willing to up and move your entire life to go, you know, work and partner into some of this stuff. So you all have different agendas. So we want to make that opportunity just really wide and available for you. So on the last slide, if you see the special general uh, admission is 500 for the VIP, which includes all of the, the dispensary VIP tour, the lab as the, and the cultivation will be $1,500. 
And uh, you can uh, buy those right online at liveoutloud.com forward slash CB workshop or call into our office uh, either way. Uh, ben, what else would you want to share with them about? I mean, many of you asked, you said, you know, I, I only want to book my flight to Vegas if I get to, you know, Boss or we, uh, Reg D or C. We'll, we'll see, we're still deciding on how we're going to uh, provide that offering to uh, to the folks. Yeah. So um, yeah. So just 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 to add a little bit more to that. So you know, cultivations are great. They're a lot of fun. Uh, uh, depending upon the, which group you come into, um, you'll you get see the plants um, and and see the product going. It, it, it's a fascinating thing for most people, especially if you've never been in one. And and and, and even if you have been in one, um, I think that I don't care how many you've been in, you'll come in our in our cultivation facility, and you'll be impressed with it. Uh, we've had very prominent people um, in the industry when they come in, they're like, "This is the best grow we we look at it." Maybe they're just blowing smoke to us, and I hate using those kinds of words. It may not be the best, but it's it's very high quality. It's very well ran, and and you'll see that. And it's a great opportunity to see one. That's 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 a rare opportunity. A lot of the growers people don't like to open them up because people walking in. Maybe you're walking in with, you know, bad stuff on you that gets into the into the grow, and that's why they're sensitive to that. We'll have growing in that facility about a million dollars worth of product. So if you walked in and you had something bad on you, we could take a million dollar loss on our plants. So that's why people are, are sensitive about that. We want to keep the group small and and we'll take them in. You'll have to wear some booties and, you know, some fun stuff to, you know, to help protect against that stuff. But it's it's fascinating and and uh, and good times to see a lot of a lot of marijuana, a lot of plants. A lot of stuff growing. Same thing on the edible side and, and on the dispensary. And, and listen, I'm an, we'll be an open book. We'll we'll tell you anything you want to know, anything we can answer, and any questions that 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 uh, you know that, that that we can help you out with. Awesome. Well, Ben, I want to thank you. Oh, there's Laura. We lost her first. Yeah, I got dropped. Yep. So those of you again that uh, we'll we're going to see the interest based on you know your action and uh, your commitment. Uh, if you want to do the VIP. Uh, again, you're going to go to the liveoutloud.com forward slash CB workshop, and uh, you'll just click on whichever offer you want. If you want the general admission, um, then you click on the 500. If you want to go VIP, I was saying, you know, as we're doing research on this, um, there are some folks who are, you know, they're charging $7,000 to go on some of these kinds of tours, and they're not getting to the, what I, you know, they're not getting the exposure that we're going to be providing you. So we're excited about it. We're going to do, like I said, what Ben said, groups of 10. And uh, we will be shutting that off, you know, as we decide over the next week and see the interest. Is there any other questions, Thomas? Ben, I would thank you. I'm excited to partner with you. Excited what we're going to be doing with this. Thank any you, Laurel. Thank you. Yeah, we we had the conversation or we had the question about how much you can grow within a facility. Um, ben, we did have a question um, again. Really, a lot of people asking about the emerging other areas. Um, do you know anything about Puerto Rico as as an option? Puerto Rico is emerging. I I know some guys that are down there doing some things, but I I can't speak to the in and out the the intimate uh, the details of it, but they do have legalization there. I know that they are either have legalized it for recreational use or are working on legalizing it for rec recreational use. Um, Puerto Rico is a very viable market and, uh, and it's definitely a viable market and there are opportunities down there for sure. Um, but I, I, I can't speak to, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to give any false information. I, I, I don't know the regulations there. I haven't looked at the Puerto Rican market in detail at all okay sounds good we have uh we want to um michelle had one more question can you have ownership or one or more growing facilities uh the short answer is uh against the state by state uh law but in most cases yes okay we're gonna uh gail had a question of clarification uh the difference between the vip and ga tickets uh, so I will speak to that. I know 
Uh, we have a lot of people. We said we we're going to go an hour. Well, obviously, we've gone over today with all the information, uh, quality education we were uh, showing everyone today. The VIP package includes a private cultivation tour, a private tour of a dispensary, as well as a tour, private tour of a lab, uh, and includes roundtable discussions, much more one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with the principals of these businesses. And it gives you a chance to really take a deeper dive into all aspects of uh, the operation. Um, very, uh, very uh, important and, and incredible opportunity to really see everything firsthand. Um, so again, uh, Sen, we want to go ahead and close it out today. Uh, for those of you who are still on, you're interested, we'd love to have you come out to Vegas. It's an easy flight from anywhere in the country. It'll be an easy weekend and be a great way to learn about uh, the emerging cannabis industry. Again, $500 ticket uh, for the GA, uh, $1,500 for the VIP uh, package. Uh, if you go or when you click on uh, liveoutloud.com slash cbworkshop, you will see that the ticket for the party has already been added. Uh, so that's taking care of you from uh, the beginning. Uh, yeah. Thomas, is, is the party included in the $1,500 ticket? No, it is not. So the ticket itself is 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 uh, without the party, but when they go to the order form, the ticket for the party has been included. So the overall price will be $597 or $1,597. And again, that's for just managing the social event uh, with the considerations for that. So if you have any questions, obviously you can call in to Live Out Loud. They'll be able to answer any question you may have, but obviously you can buy online. Again, we'd love to have you. It's in a, a, Vegas is an incredibly easy city to get to. It'd be a fun weekend, uh, great of education, great experience, uh, and we'd love to see everyone out there. So Laurel, I will go ahead and let you close it out with any final words, ma'am. Um, I'm good. I think uh, the thing I would like is we're going to keep the chat open. I'd like to hear from you just like last week. Um, you're you know, co-creating based on your interests. So if you have questions, things that you want us to dig deeper into, bring other experts. Uh, you know, Ben is, uh, you know, has a huge reach into uh, the folks that are in this industry and who we can bring to our conversations as well as uh, the tour. The sooner you sign up, the more we can get things organized. So we actually see the volume of the people that are coming and committing. Gabe will be calling from our office to confirm you. Um, if you want to add guests, uh, you know, let, give them the same link. Uh, ben, anything else on your side? I think for now, let's let us know. Stay on the chat and let us know what you're interested in. And obviously, your you know, commitment to be in Vegas with us will help us design as well as get the hotel. Our goal is to have the hotel booked by uh, next week's call. And we will be in Vegas the next few days, uh, the Live Out Loud team, and working with Ben to solidify that. So your, your actions today tell us a lot. So we're excited. Ben, anything else? I don't, I don't think so. We'll 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 uh, we'll do our best to you know we'll, we'll, we're we're going to have some great people there you know Laurels you know uh, political people they're experts in that process. It's one thing about the the cannabis space is is that was a, a new to me and I think new to a lot of people is the the political side of it. It's an important component to it, and so we'll have that as well included, especially in the VIP process to be able to really dive down deep in that and that can really make a big difference for people as they get into their cannabis businesses and and uh and you know on those tours and and next week as well um on the webinar we'll we'll deal with some of those political issues okay all right thanks you all thanks Live Out loud team thomas for uh, moderating i'll have you stay with the group and uh, keep the chat open and bring us feedback as we get prepared again for next wednesday same time and we are uh, we're doing an assumption registration, which means uh, if you were here today, we are assuming you want to be back next week, and uh, we'll be putting you into the reg list. So we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, all of you. Have a great day. So I hope you enjoyed our webinar, our series on cannabis. It's an industry that is going to revolutionize and change the way we do a lot of business. The pharmaceuticals are going to get involved, the tobacco companies, the gaming companies. It is an industry to be reckoned with. And I hope you are, even if you don't invest, do the product, just watch an industry grow, watch and learn. It is a rare moment in our lifetimes that a new industry comes alive that is this prohibitionary <laughs> and has such extreme uh, energy and conflict around it. 
So I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to continue to do tours. So check our website over at liveoutloud.com at all times. And uh, we will let you know where we are buying and where we will allow you to do some tours. And actually, if you're interested in the industry, let us know. Email our company at info, I-N-F-O, at liveoutloud.com. And uh, we would love to help you. And as always, with uh, our entire podcast, you go to asklaurel.com and uh, let us know what you need who you want connected with because we have an extraordinary database of access and we love helping people make money. Talk to you soon. Thank you for joining Laurel for this segment of Real Money Talks, how to make money, manage money, and invest money. To continue this new conversation and to find free resources to support your wealth creation, visit asklaurel.com forward slash podcast gifts. That's A-S-K-L-O-R-A-L dot com forward slash podcast gifts. Thanks for listening and join us again soon. New episodes are released every week.